Welcome to the Tuesday Review. Um, I'm Nathan, and I'm joined by Callum in the studio. How are you, Callum? Yeah, not bad. How and are you? Good. And joined all the way from Canberra, Alum over the phone. How are you going, Alum? Pretty good, thank you. Excited for a new show. Yeah, definitely. Um, a little bit of maintenance before we start the show. Um, a minor correction: Disney Star or Disney Plus Star is actually coming in Australia on the 23rd of February, not the 29th, as we'd stated last week. Um, and uh, on that note, we've actually got some programming that's finally been announced for what we're actually getting for our Disney Star. Yeah, specific they are, to Australia. Yeah. yeah, they are increasing the price by three dollars a month, which is you know just or four dollars a month. Which, considering what we're getting, it's fine. Yeah, considering what we're getting, that's perfectly fine. It brings it more in line with other streaming services. Um, as for Disney um, creating originals for the streaming service, we're getting Big Sky, Love Victor, Hellstrom, which is like a comic show. And Solar Opposites. Um, and then we're getting an assortment of movies from like the sort of um, Warner Brothers uh, staple. Back catalog, yep. Yeah, so uh, a few notable ones. We're getting all the Alien movies, um, some uh, some good comedies, uh, you know, um, lots of those sort of Warner Brothers, like Die Hard type, like um, really sort of the, the staples of the, the back catalog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's cool to see... Um, it's cool to see those kind of movies coming out to a streaming service where they won't probably, or fingers crossed, they won't leave the service after three months because of yeah. rights issues. Um, so that, that could be good. That could be a good way to sort of, this is a good way for Disney to go if they're actually going to... It helps build their brand. Yeah, yeah, it helps build their brand. If if movies, like the part's probably with Netflix, right? All good third-party movies, eventually they leave Netflix because they're not originals and they have licensing agreements. But if Disney, Disney owns everything, nothing, theoretically, nothing should leave unless Disney... Yeah, has some sort of plan to rotate in where content rotate out, which doesn't really make sense in an environment where owning the IP is the, is the goal. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Obviously, nothing's set in stone. As far as television goes, this is where things get more interesting for me. Um, you have like 24, the action series, seasons one through eight, um, and the spin-off shows, and um, Alias, and Buffy, Angel, like Firefly... It might be interesting to go back and watch as someone who didn't really watch Buffy when it was on the air. might be interesting to go back now and see it because it's held up as one of the all-time sci-fi greats, yeah. horror greats. The, there are shows missing. Like Family Guy, is, we're just getting season 18 and I'm guessing that's because of possibly rights issues with Foxtel or Stan or whoever owns that um, intellectual properties license for streaming in Australia. But uh, I think in these sorts of situations, after after those contracts end, I'm sure we'll get the rest of the seasons. Um, like Greek, seasons one to six, shows that I don't think have ever really been on streaming before at all, which is no, interesting. I remember Greek being on Foxtel, I'm pretty sure. And then that yeah. was pretty much it. Yeah, like Hill Street Blues, other older shows that I'm really not sure I've ever seen on streaming um, anyway. And those kinds of things um, will be interesting to see on streaming for the first time, whether you like them or not. Like Kyle XY is a, is a turd of a show, but it deserves its place in the sun. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, MASH with the specials, but I'd like to see the actual TV show itself in its entirety on streaming. I'd be down with that. Uh, you know all, all those kinds of more interesting shows the complete x-files which is on some other services at the moment son of zorn which is on foxtel um so we're getting some interesting stuff from disney plus and uh, especially with the sort of the content schedule we're getting on the marvel side of things and the star wars side of things like we just had um what, what was it the uh the mandalorian air and then in through what november december and then in january we've had one division through February, and then in February we have um, Captain America and Winter Soldier, whatever it That'd is. That'd be good, yeah. Um, air, airing February through March. So we're getting a, cons a constant content stream. Because if you remember, Callum, when Disney Plus launched, it, our basically opinion of it was, well, it has The Simpsons, but what else will it have going for it? Yeah, especially when we consider that the timelines for the Marvel shows weren't set in stone. Like, we didn't know that um, the new Falcon... And Winter Soldier show was going to be like going on at either the same time or very close after WandaVision, which is a game changer. The fact that they're slating these shows to be close together because it keeps the audience engaged. Yeah, that, that's and we, exactly did, right. we didn't know that at the time, let alone when it came out. We, you know, how their plans for the Star Wars universe in TV, we knew they were doing things, but the scope is so much larger than I assumed. 
Yeah, that's it. And um, these are obviously these are just the first shows announced to be coming to Disney Plus Star. Um, and assumedly, um, when rights issues or contracts end, we'll, we'll constantly get beginning more. Yeah. And I think in five years, um, a five year prediction here on the Tuesday review, in five years, if we're still doing this show, we'll be talking about how Disney Plus, it very well, Callum, it could possibly be the ultimate streaming service. Because Disney just flat out owns everything at the end of the day. Well, I mean, the point, I think that for countries like Australia, once Disney acquired Fox, I'm assuming one of the big points was to try and expand Hulu as outward as they could because, of course, um, Hulu was an American service for those who don't know it. Um, And it's like second only to Netflix, you Mm. know, in America. Um, And over here, of course, we didn't have that. And now they're merging that into... The Australian market through Disney Plus, so I think that once, the, like you said, in a few years, Disney's the streaming service is going to be quite large because it's essentially like two big platforms merging together for the Australian market. Yeah, so it's um, going to be significantly larger than say Disney Plus might be in America because they have all their Hulu stuff going to Hulu. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it stars an international brand. Yeah, um, whereas Disney is a Hulu, obviously Hulu in America. Um, the only thing I can think of that will put a spanner in these works is uh, Rupert Murdoch and Binge and Foxtel and the, and the dying throes of Foxtel yeah the dying throes of Foxtel because they yeah. obviously they have content agreements with Fox for some stuff unfortunately Australia has deep ties to, to that kind of empire the Murdochcracy yeah and uh, the problem that, you know and that's not a problem right I'm a pro-capitalist but at the end of the day rights issues cause a big problem for streaming services trying to come here internationally a huge problem especially when you have a company like foxtel which has historically shown that they will acquire rights and just sit on them not play them not show them not release them exactly and look we're just lucky that disney has more lawyers Um, yeah and more money so (laughs) it'll be fine it'll be fine but i feel like there might be um you know a few sort of hits either way because i don't see foxtel wanting to um we you know relinquish some of the shows that it's had exclusive rights for for many years and just done nothing with them. Yeah, but we'll see. I, I think this is really positive, and I think yeah, in five years, I think Disney Plus for Australians it might be better value than Netflix because Netflix plays that. I know they're gearing more towards originals now, but I think Disney Plus will be better, more benefit for families, just because they have so many originals that are oriented for families. Primarily, oh, no, no, but if you look at the star list. Um, I'll, I'll link it to you. You can see the entire roster of the no, just at launch. I've, yeah, no, no, I've seen them. But what I mean is, Netflix, it approaches it with a scatter gun. It does lots of different things for different people, different demographics. When I say Disney Plus, I'm not talking about Star primarily. Oh, I am because I mean, Star could... Star's like mostly just acquisitions. I'm talking about things that Disney Plus is going to generate. Um, like the things like the Star Wars shows, the Marvel shows. Oh no! Shows. But what's the difference? If it's an exclusive home of a certain show, it's an exclusive home. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. My point. I'm sorry to speak more eloquently. Disney Plus provides more for families than Netflix does, and I think in five to ten years that will be a fact. Yeah, yeah, it does. That's what I'm I, saying. I'm I, saying for families, Disney Plus will be more of a benefit than say Netflix because Netflix has a more broad. Yeah, but I, I, I also think with the way Disney Plus is going, it's going to provide more for everybody, just total, more for everybody in general as well. I, I think, honestly, I, like if, if Disney starts, um, you know, collating everything it owns into the one place, it will be better than all of the other streaming services in five to ten years, by far. I think one thing to consider is obviously Disney Plus, despite being obviously with the, the big company supporting it, Disney Plus itself is relatively fresh. Um, we are yet to see kind of where they take those shows that they're making specifically for Disney Plus. Netflix has frequently just done the thing of like, oh, you like this show? You really like it? Oh, we spent a lot of money on it. Now it's done for up to two seasons. Yeah, it breaks you can go, you know, Like, it's just... And if it was just like a couple of shows, it would also be like understandable, but they've done so many. Look, so it's just... If, if if Disney does the same thing, I think they'll run into that similar trouble. But if they obviously come to the market later, 
with streaming. Yeah. They've seen the mistakes and seen, I guess, the, the good points of the other companies. Well, um, Netflix has also stopped borrowing now, apparently, now that they're in pure um, asset mode, as in they're just like they're now living off subscriptions as opposed to borrowing. So that might change the way Netflix do business because uh, Netflix has not been a profitable business for many years. Uh, they've actually pretty much worked entirely in debt almost. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if their new approach, now that they've, I guess, acquired as much debt as they needed, um, will will change the way they do business with cancellations. Time will tell. Probably not. Uh, it might make them cancel more because yeah. they just can't afford to budget anymore, um, you know, with the sort of prices they were spending on original content. Um, but yeah, basically, you know, Disney coming in with Disney Star, um, you know, the Disney Star expansion, yeah, the price is rising, but... Like, now we also have a base that I would say is comparable to all the other streaming services in size and scope. And, mm. like, a lot of these shows, are, are not all of them, but a lot of them are, are full package deals. You have the complete run of the show. Like, you have the 11 seasons of the X-Files, you have this, you have that, you have the entire library at your disposal. So, for, like, someone, like, you know, if you're watching at home and you, you're starting getting into a show for the first time, you're not going to worry about it being cancelled. Because of yeah. Netflix doesn't have the money because it's already there. All it's all there for you. So like, you know, you you have that sort of peace of mind of like Disney's. Yeah, sure, the show might have come out in the nineties, but some of these shows haven't been on streaming before, so they're going to find a whole new audience. And like, I'm just going through the list now. Like American Dad, I was trying to watch that using Hulu, I believe, at last, yeah. which I'm like, technically we weren't supposed to be using Hulu. So like, having American Dad season one to season fifteen, that's really helpful. Because I want to go through the whole show. I, I absolutely love the show when I watch clips of it. Um, yeah. It's just, it's a good time. And finally being able to do that legally. I, well, it was always legal. Well, we were never breaking any laws opinion. by using yeah, it. No, no. We, we were paying. We were paying. We were just in a different country, that's all. Um, but just being able to watch that with like an ease of just like... Yeah, there's no... You don't have to TV. jump through any hoops to get to it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, like the... the um, you know, I did, obviously, I don't think I did the... I did, I did not do the list any justice. Um, it would take us all day to go through the list. And oh, it's a it very, movies, but it's a extensive. very long list. It's ex- it's absolutely extensive, and it, it ranges like it has the hill. They have the hills have eyes. Disney is going to have the hills have eyes on its streaming service. The original, yeah, number that's, one and two. That's bizarre. Yeah, like it. It's absolutely like there's everything for everybody. Yeah. So, like it's it's completely ran like not random obviously, but it's not exactly the Disney brand. And I'm glad they expanded their goal for Disney Plus to include adults. Well, they're always going to. I remember uh, quite a while ago, before um, Disney Plus even came out in Australia, uh, they had said that eventually the goal was to put Hulu in most countries. And I so said this is just an extension of that. So I'm not surprised they have such an exhaustive catalog. Um, the real question, of course, is will we get Hulu originals? Like, how is that going to work? Uh, yeah, maybe certain, eventually. Because certain shows, of course, in Australia yeah. that are Hulu originals, you can't really watch here. Uh, most of them go to Stan. Yeah. Or Amazon Prime. Palm Springs, uh, which is a very, very good Hulu original movie, is on Amazon Prime. And yeah, like, so like, how's that going to work contractually? I, I think, well, it's all Disney. So I think contractually, like, stuff going forward now will, might just release on Disney Star in Australia mm-hmm. instead of like Stan or Amazon Prime or wherever else they license it out. Yeah, and once those licenses are up, they'll probably bring the original stuff that was out and about on Stan and whatnot. <clears throat> yeah, um, and I reckon, because like there are some exceptions here, like Grey's Anatomy seasons 15, 16, 17, that would be a Stan or an Amazon Prime issue where the show's already out here. And I think as the years go by, we'll just get more and more of uh, sort of a, a filling in of the shows. Um, so mm. I, I'm I'm quite hopeful. I think it's a good time. I think it's going to be a good time. I think it's going to be extensive. We're going to have to do a proper review when it actually launches in Australia and we can have a feel about how... Because like the other worry is, much like Binge, is there's a lot of content on Binge, but the UI is garbage. It's hard to navigate. It's uh, hard to find new programs. Uh, so dog shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's the other challenge Disney's going to have rolling out Star in Australia is having a usable user, like a you know, word salad, a usable user interface. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it needs to... Is it, Unfortunately, is it, not everybody meets the Netflix standard. No. Um, you know, Amazon, and it's Amazon not also hard. famously has a struggle. <laughs> Amazon, it's, it's like the, the richest company in the world has the worst user interface yeah. available by, by a far and away. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, you can have all the great content, but if it's going to be as hard as it is for us to find content on Binge, then it's, it's going to be annoying. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know... Disney Plus at the moment, it looks fantastic. They actually use their interface. Well, yeah, I mean, Binge was also rushed, you know. Oh, yeah, Binge was a contract job. They had, legally, they had to do it, otherwise HBO Max would launch in Australia. And that's our internet conspiracy theory, generally. Well, I mean, it kind of bears out as well. It's it's also based in reality. Um, Yeah, but we'll see what happens. It's a very positive thing, so. Yeah, yeah. Moving on to our next topic related to Disney Plus, um, uh, we're not going to review. We're not doing a review of One Division yet. We'll do a proper review of One Division after the season is finished. Spoiler alert for One Division um, up up until now, um, but mainly focusing on one specific event that and spoiler for the, Age of Ultron. Yeah, spoil well spoilers for all of Marvel stuff really when we're talking about anything Marvel related, um, but we're going to be spoiling something specific to the latest episode of One Division. So if you haven't seen it. Please turn off the show now. Yeah. Uh, so the latest episode involves the appearance of Quicksilver, but not the Quicksilver we knew from Age of Ultron. It's the Quicksilver from the X-Men movies. Yeah, which is which was owned and operated by a different company entirely. Yeah. And f- for those who aren't really aware, um, various companies have made um, Marvel properties at various times. Mm. I believe those are Fox. And, yeah, and um, um, Sony maybe? I can't remember, but yeah, anyway, long story short, there was a very bitter legal legal goings-on between Marvel and at least Fox. And Disney gobbled up the competition. Yeah, and for a long time, there was a complete, very stark separation between the X-Men universe uh, in, in the film in the film world and the Marvel MCU universe. And those were very incompatible things because, you know, legal troubles. Um yeah, and they just, just at the time Marvel just didn't own the X Men yeah. in in their movies, um, and obviously that's now changed. And Disney technically owns all properties. Um, yeah, it's because I, I think some people also forget that Marvel wasn't always the financial behemoth that it is now. Uh, they actually sold the rights um, to so, sold some rights to Sony for the Spider Man movies um, because they were flat out broke. Yeah, they were going broke, uh, and of course now. You know they've kind of clawed their well, way back Robert, up. Robbie Down, Robert Downey Jr. and John Favreau saved Marvel. Yeah, li- quite literally, yeah. Um, from being basically um, broke. Uh, so of course Sony was very unwilling to give those rights to Spider Man back. And as far as I'm aware, the relationship that Spider Man has with the MCU is not set in stone. It's very much a contractual yeah. thing where you can have him for X amount of movies yeah. and then we get but, him back. But not but that is not the case for the Quick, X Silver. Yeah, exactly. For the X the X Men sort of movies. Now that Disney owns everything, did um you know, Marvel can start weaving the X Men and mutants back into the, the movie universe. Um and this is prob most likely the uh the sort of first hint at that when we get the X Men, the um the Fox version of the movies, um into the MCU for the first time, uh, apparently. Um uh, obviously nothing's really confirmed. Um but you know, we, we can speculate and it's not an unreasonable guess. Yeah. Uh we see Evan Peters as Quicksilver, who is Quicksilver in all of the X Men movies released to date. Um and, you know, I love Evan Peters. He's in, like, almost every season of American Horror Story. Fantastic actor, he's yeah. He's a fantastic actor. Um, and uh, he he, uh, he does he, he does a bit of Quicksilver than the actor that played Quicksilver in the, uh, the MCU. The MCU. Yeah. Well, but that I was a weird... Even... That was a weird direction. Yeah, they, they threw him away. He wasn't, like, a permanent part of the MCU. He was kind of just there for some reason, and then they killed him off. Um, very unfair. But, like, he was sort of like a dodgy Russian version of Quicksilver, and it was a little bit weird. Um, when, you know, the Quicksilver in at least the X-Men movies is more of a likable character. Yeah, I mean, though, he was always uh, Eastern European, but the they kind of just disposed of him. There was no there was no room for character growth yeah. with the MCU version of Quicksilver. He was kind of just there he, to He was die. there to get killed by yeah, Ultron. He was, he was there um, to die, that's pretty yeah. much it. And to make one demand. Um but uh, and now he's in Wonder Vision as played by Evan Peters. Um, 
whether it's just a really weird recasting slash Easter egg, or if this is the actual entry point for the mutants slash the X Men universe into the MCU, look, time yeah. will tell. But it's looking likely. We don't know yet. It hasn't been uh, my, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been fully announced about the plans going forward by Marvel. But I think that my perspective is why would they do this? Considering that, of course, Disney owns Mar a Fox now, so they can. I'm assuming. They can legally use whatever they own. There's no... What are they going to do? Fight their own lawyers? You know, and like... Yeah, no. So... But, uh, uh, but this is what it means. It could just be an Easter egg that someone just didn't really think about how the fans would react. Would that... that Do you think that would be a good publicity stunt, though? Because I think it would be a trophy. Yes, people talking. Yeah, but it would damage their brand. I don't know. What do you reckon, Alan? I'm on two sides. So oh, my real question is, is it weird if this Quicksilver hits on Wanda? Yes, because they're brother and sister. Uh, moving on. From um, different parallel universes. Yes. Different parallel universes, <laughs> so they're not related. Now, um, <laughs> look, the way I... I was going to ask the hard hitting questions. The way I think about it is this. Of course, the Scarlet Witch in the MCU does not operate the same way that Scarlet Witch does in the comics, unfortunately. But her powers are unpredictable in both. Um, and of course, if you've, if you've watched, if you're up to date with WandaVision, you know that the town of Westview, I believe it's called, is pretty much entirely her creation. Like, the people who are living in it, the appearance of it, um, you know, just the general aesthetic and environment is under her control. I believe they're using the unpredictable nature of Wanda's powers to potentially create a merging between the MCU and the Fox X-Men universe. Because my feeling as a Marvel fan is why would you take something that the people want? Because most Marvel fans would very much like the X Men to be a part of the MCU just because of the storyline potential, not necessarily the characters. That, you know, you can make an argument for who you like and who you don't like, but the scenarios could be much greater if the X Men joined because that has implications throughout the, the movies going forward. It, you know, new bad guys new heroes, new arcs, new interactions. Uh, it just broadens the scope and it broadens the hero base that they can play with. So, and Pete, they know, you know, I guarantee you executives or whatever, they know, they're on Twitter, they've seen the message boards, they know people want, um, ever since the acquisition, I should say, they know that people have been excited for this because of the potential. Um, you know, so I, I feel like setting up Evan Peters... So, for context, at the end of the episode, uh, of the latest episode, to she kind of opened, there's a knock at the door, and Evan Peters is there, and she's like, oh my god, it's my brother. Or I, or I should say, he says, oh, hello, sister, or whatever. And, um, you know, they, there's even a joke about it where, because uh, for people who haven't seen WandaVision, it's a fake sitcom set in the MCU where WandaVision runs a fake, uh, Wanda runs a fake sitcom that they're terming WandaVision which is the name of the show as well. So one of the characters goes, oh my God, she recast Pietro, alluding to the fact that it's Evan Peters and not the, the previous uh, actor. So why would they do something that they know the audience wants only to make them mad when it's a fake out? That well, would be terrible publicity. According to um, IndieWire.com, in an article, uh, Schaefer and Marvel compared Evan Peters' surprise appearance to classic sitcom tropes where well-known characters are recast without much fuss and noted that she hatched the idea early into her work on the series with executive producer Mary Livanos. So there's a potential, like, yeah, there could be merging something greater or they're just having a goof. There's a potential for both. Obviously, time will tell. Um, I think they should be more upfront about their plans because if they're going to be leading people along that way, I think it's not a good PR move. And I think... Oh, 100%. As strange as, as strange as this is going to sound, Marvel has very loyal fans. I think it's disrespectful for Marvel to be playing with people's emotions in that way. Especially, like I said, this isn't just some character that they're bringing out from the comics. It's the implication of what's something the people have been wanting since the MCU started. Exactly. It's not so much about this one character. It's about the implication of bringing the mutants and like Xavier's school and everything else that comes along with that As into yeah. the MCU. Especially when you consider just frankly how bad the X-Men movies are when compared to the MCU films. Their leagues, there's mile, they're miles apart in quality. 
Yeah. Which is not to say that all the all the X-Men movies are bad. A few of them are quite good. But we all know that, you know, Marvel Entertainment can do a better job. Oh, definitely. Um, and now we... Look, me and Alan have been watching a show called The Expanse. Callum and James haven't seen it. Um, and um, it is quite possibly, in my opinion, one of the best science fiction, action, drama, thriller shows of all time. Um, and Alan also feels quite strongly about it. Don't you, Alan? I absolutely love it. It is a great space show. And it does things, I'd say, probably as well as the best of them, if not better. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, you, people t- people throw the term space opera around, yeah? Like, it's a big sort of, you know, like an epic, grand, sweeping opera in space. And people throw that term around a lot. And it's not always justified. Most of the time, it's not justified. But I feel like mm. The Expanse is so big in scope. It's so big in themes. And it's so big on action and, like... It's it meets all the criteria of what possibly is the greatest science fiction show of all time. Like, there's not something as dated as Star Trek, um, the original series. Like, for a modern show, even a not so modern show, it it it's up there with the best of them. I would argue. Definitely, like it, because uh, well, I'm gonna use Star Wars as an example. Like, I think we all love to go to Star Wars for a lot of this. Um, most of the time. The space aspect is brought into it when you're having like a gunfight, and that's about it. The rest of the time, yeah. you could be, you could really be anywhere. Like, there's no sense of urgency or like the, the idea been... that you're really actually in space and yeah. the even vacuum with, um, outside wants to kill you. Even with Star Wars, especially if you take the new movies into consideration, they don't really think or consider space at all, or the implications of what space is. Um, yeah. They flat out change how physics works to suit the movies because they don't really think yeah. about space. And um, yeah, they uh, they uh, what do you call it? They um, uh, they, cha- uh, they change light, the... light warp warp speed it warp speed yeah. everything. Yeah, they change the uh, they, um... they change the rules of physics in their universe I was, to suit the yeah. narrative. I, I was yeah, I, I was reading, um, and this is the opposite. Like I was reading an article on the internet today about how realistic is the expanse in its depiction of space. And obviously it's science fiction, you know, we don't have the technology they have. And so obviously it's leaps and guesses, but mm-hmm. um, as far as they treat space, it's a hundred percent. It's one of the most realistic shows that you can watch or movies you can watch because of how they treat space and the danger around it and the dangers of high speed space travel. Yeah. And like all the issues that go along with that. Um, and so like, yeah, as a show, it treats space with like res- the respect that re- and really the fear that it deserves. Like they're yeah. always like, you know, a few millimeters or a few inches away from death all the time. Oh. And, uh, and yeah, the way they, the way the ships are also organized, like the, the kind of redundancy you, you'd expect in a system that was, you know, supposed to run in space properly. Like right now we've got nothing. We've got the International Space Station. That's about it. But it's similar to like the kind of redundancy stuff you'd expect in the International Space Station, where if there was a small vacuum leak or something of that nature, like how they'd quickly fix it, how they'd have tools in basically uh, all locations, that kind of thing. That's basically how the ships look and how they work. So it's like like a massive amount of respect kind of goes to how much effort they put into kind of making this a it's a show about space in space and space matters, you know? Exactly. It matters. And it doesn't matter in Star Trek. It doesn't matter in Star Wars. It doesn't matter in most of the science fiction shows you watch because they're about other things. But this show is about space. And it's mm. about more than that. Obviously, there's aliens and mysteries and like all kinds of stuff going on. But the overarching, the, the, the always the most pressing issue really is the fact that you're in the middle of a vacuum. <laughs> like you're in space. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like yeah. you've got a finite supply of fuel, finite supply of guns and ammo, finite supply of food and water and oxygen, most importantly. So you can't just, you know, just go around everywhere and you have to, you know, restock supplies. Yeah, and, um, and, and the fact that the Expanse manages to balance, like, the pressing issues that come with space travel, as well as balancing, like, a really and intriguing... And actual storyline. Yeah, yeah, an actual storyline behind that. Like, the the, the show really is... It's a marvel. It's a masterpiece mm. of science fiction. The way that it, it handles its sort of threat uh, from space, it handles like a, an ingen- like an ingenious political mystery, an alien mystery, like also themes and subjects of like um, you know like a moral nature of like gives us things a philosophical nature it gives us things to think about. 
um, and like, you know, all those kinds of issues. Um, it deals with, you know, like immigration and war and all these other topics and it handles them all really well of a backdrop that a backdrop that's really, truly epic. Yeah. Um, and we're really, we're only going to be, we're going to be focusing on season five because it does some interesting things. But like, but we'll um, give a, a brief recap of, I guess, how the story has developed. Um, it's set basically hundreds of years in the future where, you know, humanity as is actually starting to colonize, you know, or has colonized a decent bit of the solar system. Um, there's you've got your three large powers: the United Nations of Earth and Luna, which is uh, you know the Earth and the Moon, um, and then the Martian Congressional Republic on Mars, and that's that, that's you know a group of Mars who obviously would have been part of the United Nations originally and declared their independence. They're always on, I guess, a um, a war footing. A war footing, yeah. They're, you know, they're always I mean, got to read to go toe to toe. But even that, obviously, now these these uh, this show is based on a series of books. Um, and so, you know, it has that to fall back on, but like the idea that it's like Mars eventually separated from, you know, earth and Luna because the distance is so great. Right. Yeah. Like that's and, like they have to look after their own. Yeah. They have to look after their own and they're so far away. Why shouldn't they be independent? Yeah. And then finally the, uh, the real cowboys, the West of space, I guess you could say, um, the, Belters. the outer planets, the outer planets Alliance, the OPA. Um, which is just yeah a loose confederation of asteroid belt and the, and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, and yeah they call themselves the Belters. They are the like hard working, you know like the, the, the space cowboys that are you know they're working off the um, the equivalent of like oil rigs and stuff, but in we, space it's ice most of the time. It's, it's yeah ice and getting some water, um, yeah. Uh, but that's that's their oil rig. That's a dangerous. I think in the first episode you see somebody lose an arm. Yeah, basically. The first episode uh, takes place on like one of those giant mining sort of ships. Yeah, yeah. and uh, guy ends up just losing his arm automatically yeah, just because of workplace accident. And um, I guess season one delves into you, you meet your your group of I guess protagonists. Um, we've got uh, St- Stephen Strait is James Holden. He's just a gentleman from Earth, but he's working in space because I don't know he's got some problems. We've got Cass <laughs> he's running Anver. away from his home life. Yeah, Cass Anva, Alex Kamal. He's probably um, my favorite. Alex is probably my favorite character in the show because, like, he, he he's like he's funny, but he's like comes from a martial military background. He's funny, but he also like for some weird reason he like he likes old like country and western music from yeah, like, he's like he's the nineteen like fifties. He's like a Texan. And it's like, yeah. it's so out of place in the future in space. I just, I love it. Uh, we've got Wes uh, Chatham playing Amos Burton, who's uh, also from Earth. He's a mechanic on the on their ship. And we've got um, Dominique Tipper playing Naomi Nagata. Uh, she's originally born and bred in the belt. And she's um, just yeah, an engineer on the ship. Those are the main, I guess, four group of characters that you end up dealing with for, I'd say, most of it, uh, with t- characters coming in and out. First season, such as Thomas Jane, he's uh, Joe Miller, the detective. Um, you basically, the first season's all about kind of finding the missing millionaire or billionaire's daughter, Julie Mao, um, among other things. And you basically it develops into a plot of basically there's a uh, alien proto molecule that's been found, um, and everyone's I guess trying to get their hands on it uh, without kind of alerting everyone else um, and kind of destroying anything that comes in the way, blaming other countries. Basically, Mars ended up getting blamed for shooting down a ship, even though they didn't do that. What um, And was in pushing Earth and Mars closer to that aspect of war. It really is just uh, an arms race to get that proto-molecule. That's like the first couple of seasons, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Like like the, the first season yeah, in, ends up kind of revealing to everyone that there's a proto-molecule um, and it basically... Uh, destroys everyone on the asteroid Eros. Uh, it, the protomolecule basically takes over. Um, season two, there's more, I guess, revealed about the protomolecule, how it can turn people into alien kind of creatures. Um, somebody from the Mars side, uh, Martian Marine Bobby Draper, who was played by, was uh, she is quite the actor, uh, Frankie Adams, probably one of the other coolest characters in the show, kind of defecting. For the tr- against Mars for the truth, uh, revealing kind of what's been going on, um, and uh, what what ends up happening. Well, they, so basically, um, Eros gets destroyed, yeah, and it what well, well, it should be taken as a message of you know you don't just have give to, me one more. 
you don't have to um, mess with the protomolecule. Instead, what happens is that everybody's now super desperate to get the protomolecule because, of course, they are, right? It's a new weapon people can use in war. Um, and the, the, the problem then is you have people weaponizing this protomolecule and creating sort of super soldiers that they can't really control. Meanwhile, our boy James Holden, um, who was impacted a little bit in the destruction of Eros um, with the protomolecule, is seeing like visions of the Thomas Jane's character telling him to do things, right? He's basically being manipulated or led or controlled or guided by what might be a manifestation of the protomolecule itself um, into doing, you know, whatever objectives the protomolecule has, which we don't frankly know because we can't understand these aliens. Um, the aliens, you know, in the show, are, like, this is another good thing, Callum. Um, Alan's not with us at the moment. But another good thing about this show is how it depicts aliens. Yeah. They're not humanoids. No. Why would they be? Yeah, yeah. why would they be? Exactly. Why would they be? So what, what do they look like? Do we Have well, you seen, like, an actual... So adult in the, quotation marks alien the proto molecule itself is almost like a blue goo okay and it was i guess a building block or a tool that they used to you know in their civilization yeah but the actual aliens as far as we've seen them visibly are like i, I guess they're sort of like um are they carbon based no they're sort of like i wouldn't know how to describe it like a smoke like, like a like particle like, smoke. Yeah, okay. Like a like a, a blue sort of white particle smoke. That's cool. Um, like Alan is, I can hear Alan back now. How how would you describe the aliens? Talking about, I'm just giving an overview of you know how the aliens now look in in this show and how they. It's not just like a carbon based humanoid sort of. Yeah, like the, their overall build is, I would say, humanoid, but their consistency is very much yeah, like the blueness from the proto molecule. Um, is there prom like I guess dominant makeup? Um, I or think particle it, smoke is. A- or is the particle smoke the other aliens? The other aliens are the particle smoke. Yeah. I think what you think about the red stuff, um, the the protomolecular aliens are the blue stuff. Um, yeah. So it's like a, a human kind of skeletal frame, a humanoid frame, and then yeah, a bunch of blue running through them, um, and they really enjoy uh, energy, like nuclear energy. Um, so like the the things used to fuel ships, uh, that's usually where they're attracted yeah, but to. Yeah, that, that, is that when humans have been turned into like the proto molecule sort of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we don't actually As... know what the original aliens looked like. But... We don't. No, no, we, we don't. Um, we still on roughly second season. Or third oh, I've just been giving a quick overview, catching people up. So I basically yeah. said that um, seasons are what two, three, and kind of four are basically just about. Well, really, two and three are about Mars and Earth fighting for control yeah. of the molecule and yeah. the OP and, as well. Yeah, and like Eros, kind of where where they initially unleash the protomolecule on people, becomes kind of sentient, um, and it like it starts kind of moving on a collision course with Earth. Um, and it seems like the proto is going to try and take over Earth, and they, they're doing their best to, like, blow it up and destroy it. Um, the original character um, played by oh, the, the Thomas Jane, Joe Miller, he, like, in his quest to kind of find Julie Mel, he finds her dead. I guess he becomes sort of infatuated with her? Well, he calls yeah. it, he, he loves her, but I feel it's an infatuation because, you know, I feel you yeah. can't love a person without ever, me, like, you know, communicating yeah, yeah. with them. But he kind of convinces her, and he goes into that um, proto molecule den and kind of like sacrifices himself with it, convinces Julie, who's like, or the essence of Julie, who's kind of, she wants to come home. And that's why this entire rock is now moving Cause Julie, uh, to Earth. Julie was sort of one of the first characters in the show that we see that sort of um, gets taken over or controlled by the proto molecule. Mm. Um, but she and kind of becomes a sentient, like, expanding glob of proto molecule yeah, like, instead of like, like as the proto molecule took her over. She gave some of her mind and intentions to the proto molecule. Yeah. Um, and and so that's why it's coming towards Earth. I guess everyone's worried that it's going to destroy the Earth and take over or whatever. So Joe um, kind of convinces her to not do that. They, otherwise, they're going to blow up Eros. That was their plan. Um, our main group's plan. And um, luckily for them, it ends up crashing into Venus. And everyone's like, "Hooray! You know, we saved it." But obviously, <laughs> I don't think. Well, the, the the future seasons clearly indicate um, 
uh, that yeah, it wasn't, of course, the best thing to happen. So um, the UN kind of in season three declares a bit of war. Everyone's still after the proto molecule. They want to know what's happening on Venus because they. It, it didn't just crash and just stop. Yeah, Something started happening there. Yeah, so things are going on. Things are happening on Venus. Yeah. And again, a lot of, um, I guess, back and forth. And it ends up, at the end of Season 3, the protomolecule that smashed into Venus forms a ring structure that gets up from Venus and then takes an orbital position beyond Uranus. And it turns on a um Like a, a portal. gate. Like a, a, yeah. a gate, yeah, a stargate of sorts. Yeah, effectively, uh, which... a, yeah, a stargate or a ring gate. Um, mm. And then season four is when they, they uh, the main characters, and really everyone's trying to stake a claim on this ring gate because, you know, it's like w- w- humans as a people, you know, we just want to colonize. Yeah, um, and just, just just sorry to cut you off there, Nathan. A little more context about season three. Um, the ring gate kind of, initially no one knows how to get through it. Our main man, um, James Holden, because he is the you know the uh, the protected one of the Deus Ex Machina of the series. Yeah, and I, he ends I, up taking. He uh, he's also sort of getting guided by what might yeah. be an essence of the proto molecule. Yeah, he ends up going through and then actually opening up the the once you're inside the the ring, there's like it's it's basically a little portal room to a bunch more rings like that can lead to of, different thousands of different universes, galaxies, yeah. or like worlds and systems. Yeah. Um, and the trick, and the trick to get through the gate was you have to go through it slowly. You have to go through it slowly, exactly. Everyone initially was going so fast that the ring would assume you're trying, you're being a threat and it would just stop you in its path. And then season four, basically, it begins of, as you said, like a bunch of different people with the OPA, Earth, Mars, rushing and running through the ring because they want, you know, they like Earth is overpopulated, Luna's mm. somewhat overpopulated, but, you know, and Mars doesn't have a lot going for it. It's a red planet. They hope to get like an ocean in a hundred years, but right now they all live in you know inside bubbles, except for the people on Earth. Everyone else is living in bubbles, having to breathe recycled air. They want like a chance of going onto real planets, and that's what this uh, ring has given them. And you you have essentially have a bunch of refugee ships from the Belt and Earth, kind of running through the gateway, trying to get into new universes because they've shown some um, some new planets. And I think the bulk of season four ends up focusing on. Uh, one of the planets there where James Holden and his crew end up going, you've got some Delta refugees and you've got some Earth operatives all fighting over a planet that's full of lithium. Um, and they, they all, they're all warring over who gets to um, who gets to mine that lithium because it's worth, obviously, a large amount of money. Mm. Um, and that's when they discover, I guess, more, um, more uh, we'll call it protomolecule civilization stuff on that planet. Uh, a machinery that you know tries to kill everyone. Yeah, and that sort of the the question is like, how many of the planet, how many of the planets are actually viable? Because whatever destroyed the original civilization, like you know, the worlds are also destroyed now. Like yeah. the the uh, the the ecology and the planets have been affected as well. So it's like, are they really just getting led into a trap? And that's kind of where I feel like hopefully further seasons will live, will go into yeah. more. Season because five the, the, really is just about the fallout of the portal rings, right? Yeah, effectively. Yeah. Um, Season five goes back far into. There's basically very little alien esque action. It's far more political war. Um, which, uh, you... While I was kind of disappointed in that, it, on reflection after finished the season, I'm glad that they didn't just go for like more head first into the alien mystery stuff. Because like, cause the way the show is grounded in really reality is that now, of course, we really need a season of Fallout because like the ramifications are huge. And like yeah. it goes back to that sort of the show being a really grounded, really well-made masterpiece of a space opera. And the fact that, yeah, we've got all this cool stuff, but we can't just stop. And we, like, we have to stop and focus on what people actually think about this and what would happen in a situation like this. It, of course, it all comes down, down back down to politics. Yeah. And and I guess one of the biggest things is at the end of um, season four, one of the biggest pirates um, of the OPA kind of area, uh, Marcos Inaros, who also happens to have a past with Naomi and a son with her. Um, he's very hell-bent on kind of making the inners, as they call them, pay. And um, he ends up, I guess, spying some stealth tech from Mars, which they shouldn't be selling to him. 
Um, because but Mars seems to be in a fire sale right now because people are like, well, if there's other planets we can go and colonize easily, why would we stick, you know, stick with Mars and you know try and build it out and also be fighting Earth at the same time? It's not worth it. I think some people are in that middle point of like, do we stay? Do we leave? You know, which side should we be on? It's kind of difficult to know which side they really should be on. And really, and also there's some there's some scenes in um, the later episodes of season five really that point towards almost lawlessness on yeah. like sort of the defectors from Mars. Um, yeah. Sort of like a really harsher way of life just, so, just because. Yeah. So Inaros uses some stealth tech, which the Martians have known to, to have since like, the early days, uh, the early seasons. And he... Um, basically cloaks a bunch of asteroids with this Martian stealth tech and launches them at Earth. Um, and I think, what is it, eight different um, asteroids end up sending through. And that's that's basically where the end season four off. So you're like, well, clearly, yes, she's going to go down in season five. Um, and then, of course, for the most part, you're still waiting for the asteroids to first hit. It's basically, as, as you said, Nathan, um, a bunch of people, like people from Earth trying to leave, people from Mars trying to leave, people from the belt trying to leave. Um, it's just now the, the Loringa has made things a lot more complicated. People, you know, people want to stake their claim in that new universe. But these these three groups, they're always in that kind of lockhead of like, who's in charge? Everyone wants to be in charge, and but nobody else wants the other party to be in charge. Exactly. Um, that's that basic human nature of like, well, you know, we want to go through, we want, you know, this stuff because there's money to be made or, you know, lives to be built, but everyone, you know, everyone's kind of holding each other back in a way. Exactly. Um, and it's just a fascinating show. And, um, look, it's disappointing that the, um, w- one of the characters, heavy spoiler alerts, one of the characters dies in this season. Um, they, uh, our boy, um, Alex, Alex come Kamal on. dies. Um, and, well, Alan and I have had this conversation uh, off the air when we feel like it should have been another character that died in this season. Um, mm. But unfortunately, it was our boy Alex because of, uh, we'll say, in real life personal issues due to do with the actor. Uh, yeah. And so he left the show. And instead of recasting him, which I wish they would, like there are, other, there are other actors that would probably kill to play this character. Yeah. And I'm Wait, sure and he doesn't die in the book. Um, yeah. And he was a solid pilot, like, and he, yeah, he, he played yeah. the character really well. And it's just like unfortunate. The, the, yeah, the the crew the the crew with Naomi, um, uh, Jim or James, um, and Amos and Alex. They were you know a few of their team members died, and they were the four man group. Like you you know Amos was the pilot. He was the best pilot they could you know Alex, get yeah. their hands on. And and I'm just like you just. Straight up killed my dude. Like, you done him dirty. Yeah, and <laughs> it wasn't even a good death. It's like, but, but then again, that also to the benefit of the show is like, he died of a, uh, suffering a stroke while going into a high-G space maneuver. It's like, and they say, well, you know, it can happen at any point. And it's like, yeah, it can, but man, it's a bit of a cop-out, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm like, it hasn't happened so far. <laughs> yeah. So it, it almost kind of reminds me of, um, so uh, in the early seasons, Jay Hernandez plays, uh, he plays, uh, detective miller's kind of side guy yeah um who's there to kind of help out and stuff and he ends up getting like stabbed by a bunch of because he's from earth and he's at he's at um one of the stations one of the belter stations and he ends up getting like stabbed by a bunch of dudes and left for dead luckily he survives but they absolutely just ignore him after like you know the first bit and i'm like i thought this was guy this guy was going to be a solid character and i was like they done him dirty and like at least that guy, he wasn't that well fleshed. He was somewhat fleshed out. But this guy, like Alex, has been in there since the beginning. And, like, you know, he's got a family and he care for everyone. And now he's just like, to kill him just for, like, you know, casting sake, I feel that's, that, was, that was a real bad decision. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, the actor allegedly may have done some, you know, nasty stuff. But at the end of the day, that shouldn't reflect on the character. Yeah, um, that shouldn't reflect on the character. Yeah, um, they could have just recast him with someone else. Oh, well, <laughs> what, what did the actor do? I don't know. Uh, look, <laughs> is it, it real bad stuff? It's, um, well, it, it's sort of, I guess, related to a lot of the Me Too stuff going around. Oh, okay. There was text messages involved of him being inappropriate with fans, or maybe pressuring them to do certain things they weren't comfortable with. Okay. Um, in you know, in uh, exchange for like being closer to the sort of the actors and stuff like that. Mm, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, 
unfortunately, you know, he he's the character that got cut. It really in this season it should have been Naomi because she risks her life a lot more in this season and does some things that I don't think would yeah would be survival. Like, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of things that I would say would would um, would kill you, um, and she takes all the risks. So I'm like, well, why would she live? That's yeah. pl- plot armor, plot armor. But yeah. it, it was also cool that a lot of this um, season, because Amos ended up going back to Earth to um, f- uh, the funeral, his foster mother, Lydia, had died, and he basically you know, went to say his final goodbyes. So you actually see him spend a fair amount of time on Earth, which I thought was quite of a plus. Like, you, you do spend a lot of time in space, but there's obviously... The asteroids incoming, and they some of them do hit Earth, and there's a massive panic going on on Earth. Um, it also has just seen that storyline happen, of like you know everyone on Earth kind of losing, you know, mm-hmm. losing their crap for for lack of a better term, and you know what actually happens when there's a mass kind of um, devastation, because normally Earth yeah it was suffering from like homelessness, uh, joblessness and stuff because it's so overpopulated, but yeah they were more, more or less taken care of. Um, yeah. This this big kind of um, I guess like not that I support Marco and Aris's actions of like hurting the inners to you know show the belt's power, but because he also had his own uh, ulterior motives, it, but it did I guess it it showed the the inner planets at least Earth like kind of the the precipice of death that the you know the Belters were living on this entire time. Exactly, exactly. It just shows you how frail life is. Um, yeah, and yeah, no, just I, I'm just still salty about um, Alex Kamal being written yeah. out of the show, but uh, yeah. especially like in this season, he had quite a good arc. Like he did, you know, he was trying to reconnect with his family, who like for some reason was a bit selfish, and they're like, "Well, you abandoned us, boy." He was saving the world. All right, excuse me. Yeah. Like if if your dad is like basically a war hero, right, and then he's like on the ship that's you know basically. Um, credited with saving the human race because they stopped Eros. They did all this. The first person through a ring gate. It's like, yeah. I mean, you cut your boy some slack. It's like, oh, sorry, sorry, son, I couldn't write to you because I'm, you know, in another dimension, like in a portal ring. Like, well, you know, excuse me. Like, I just feel like, yeah, he might not have been the best parent, but like, it was not like he was not doing anything. And like, it's sort of like you saw this season him trying to reconnect with his family and there was like some stuff happening and building and it almost feels like they decided to write him out right at the end. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they were building his character up and then maybe like they were pressured or, you know, allegations came to light and something came up and then they just sort of had to cut him off hard. Exactly. Like he had, I think, a actual a storyline and like a conclusion that he could have gone to. Exactly. Probably in the next couple of seasons, but it, they just yeah absolutely kind of cut that out. It just it um, felt rough. It felt too rough. You know what I mean? Like it was too yeah. harsh. Like there was no yeah. conclusion to his arc. Like there were things happening in his arc. He was trying to reconnect with his family, and like there were things going on, and like his relationship with Bobby and working yeah. things out. Like it just it it wasn't it wasn't a good way for him to end. That's, yeah. Yeah, but um, look, I really enjoyed the season though. Overall, it still yeah. probably is my favorite science fiction show. Definitely, and like the one of the favorite parts was okay. This season, you got kind of a break from a lot of the sci-fi alien business, but they did mention it. And then, like right at the end, you're just like, "Oh crap!" It's going right back into the alien mm. stuff. Because um, like yeah, because uh, so what? How did obviously you know major spoilers for everything, but especially for the end, is they bring some proto molecule through the gate. Yep. So um, the the um, Marcus and Aris and his people steal proto molecule from the OPA, uh, from Fred, uh, who's I guess one of the heads of the OPA, who had been given the proto molecule by Naomi as like a final defense kind of thing of like, hey, if Earth and Mars try to attack you, you can use this as like a bartering chip. And um, Marcus and Aris knows about it. He steals it, and he gives that to the MCRN. Uh, the emissary and um, who had been obviously selling him stuff this entire time, and they decide to um, transit through with the um, uh, what do you call it with the proto molecule to Laconia, which is you know, another world beyond one of the gates. Um, and, and boy, uh, whatever alien may or may not have wiped out the first civilization did not like that. Yeah, 
So those are the entities the, that... Uh, the, it's like all, it's all happening off screen, which is also kind of cool, but so the certain parties have also been using the protomolecule to test on the dead planets that have all these sort of machinery going on. And they have like, there's a lot more than, there's a lot more that characters in the show know than our main characters do about the inner workings of these civilizations and the proto molecule. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it'll need a solid two seasons to probably explain. Yeah. I heard it's going on hiatus after the next season. I hope not for too long because if they don't finish this season, like if they don't finish the story, I'll be devastated. Yeah. Like, so have, have the books it's based off have they all been finished uh i'm not sure but like then he's the dude's not going to quit if they're not so because it's, it's a massive hit now the books are big now <laughs> yeah because yeah, look if, i can wait if, we can if always wait for more book books. material like i think that's fair enough that they're going to wait for a little more book material and you know no nah, i think the book series is quite extensive like i think there's much more than what we're the, the, the next book is planned for 2021. Oh, cool. So it does have, um, there is still some more to go. Oh, I can't hear Alan. One second. Well, yeah, maybe they're waiting for the books. Um, okay, we've lost connection to um, Alan. Oh, there we go. I, I, I can still hear you guys. Um, it's, I think, well, we're running out of time, but I, I really enjoyed the show. If you are into space, kind of stuff like space i guess opera um it is probably the show to watch you will not be disappointed yeah there's still a lot of meat on them bones as well uh, yeah, yeah look i think that's all the time we have for tonight thank you for joining us um over the phone alan all the way from canberra it is always a pleasure i'll see you guys next right, week and thank you callum for joining me in the studio as always um hopefully james will be back on the show within within you know three three or four weeks hopefully he's really busy with work at the moment um you can listen to our show Live on the air at 98.9 Northwest FM on Tuesdays, 6, uh, 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. You can also catch the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Shout Engine, or wherever you listen. Uh, please like and share the Facebook page, and we'll catch you next week. Adios, cousins.